Good morning and thanks for joining the virtual ESHE 2020. Also many thanks to the organizers to invite me to give this talk on optical mapping for clinical structure variant detection. Just for full disclosure, I'd like to mention that BioNano has covered some of our reagent costs. Sydney Brenner already predicted that new techniques can have tremendous impact on our field. And over the last decade or so, we have witnessed how NGS has transformed our field. Some even say that the sequencing technologies have transformed human genetics from an art to an industry. However, maybe we still need art. With this, I refer to the art of cytogenetics. I think we all appreciate that Molecular cytogenetics or cytogenetics is still extremely valuable to get the most comprehensive diagnostics. It can also assist in disease gene identification. It is important for the most complete reference genomes, but can also help us to understand mutational mechanisms or give us insights into evolution. The earliest gene identification studies made use of cytogenetic techniques. For example, here, germline mutations that cause CGD or somatic cytogenetic aberrations, like the identification of the Philadelphia chromosome, which later led to the identification of the bcr able fusion gene, which even had enormous impact on personalized treatment of CML. CNV microarrays were probably the one technology that has really transformed molecular cytogenetics. First of all, as a disease gene identification tool, as shown here in the example by my dear colleague Lysenka Fissers, who identified the underlying gene for CHARGE syndrome. Secondly, CNV microarrays really transformed the way we di do diagnostics. Uh, and as such, we identified disease causing pathogenic CNVs in 10 to 15% of cases now routinely. Despite the successful application of all these technologies, there is not yet a single technology that can identify all the structure variants in an individual genome. We now know that structural variants are very important, particularly also for human disease. And if we just compare numbers here, Structure variants impact many more base pairs than any other type of human genetic variation. And cumulatively, SVs impact more than 10 megabases of human sequence. Groundbreaking work by the lab of Evan Eichler has shown that segmental duplications in the human genome can enrich certain regions for structural variants. And in particular, these repeat-rich regions make it difficult to assess each and every SV present in a genome. Just to summarize what I've shown you so far, structure variants are important. They happen in complex regions, and unfortunately, classical NGS approaches are not necessarily ideal for its detection. This brings me back to my initial analogy. It could be that we still need art. But maybe time is right for modern art. So maybe time is right for next generation cytogenetics to complement next generation sequencing. One method that boosted the resolution of classical cytogenetic tools and also allowed the access of very complicated regions of the human genome is fiber fish. This is, however, a non trivial technology that was only mastered by a few groups around the globe including the laboratory in Leiden. The method of fiber fish is also known as molecular combing and has now been industrialized by a company called Genomic Vision. This enables the simultaneous study of one to 200 genome copies per cover slip. And this allows to study single molecules that are up to 10 megabases in size. The resolution that this fiber fish allows is roughly one kilobase pair in size. The beautiful demonstration of the resolution power of fiber fish here comes from Christelle Dupien. Her group identified an unstable repeat expansion in the gene called March 6 as a cause for
for a specific type of epilepsy. As you can see on the lower left, patient samples on the left have a much expanded repeat colors in red compared to controls on the right hand side. Another beautiful demonstration of the utility of fiberfish comes from the lab of Joris Vermeesch. His group has shown that fiberfish enables the resolution of low copy repeats of the 22Q11 locus. These beautiful data may make you wonder whether there is an option to get fiberfish on steroids. So ideally one would have a technology that still has a similar resolution and not no bias towards sequence content. But ideally that would be genome wide, easy to analyze and really complementary to NGS approaches. This brings us to a technology known as whole genome mapping. The first example is a technique commercialized by a company called Napsis. They perform whole genome mapping electronically. Scientists from Napsis have already shown recently that their electronic genome mapping technology can assist sequencing assemblies. My understanding, however, is that the throughput that this technology offers so far does not yet allow the study of human genomes. However, here's an example where two strains of Salmonella were compared and an inversion was identified in one of the two strains in the bottom picture. For the remainder of the talk, I'd like to focus on optical mapping. And here in particular, technology that is commercialized by bionanogenomics and is now known as genome imaging. Optical mapping by genome imaging is really just digital karyotyping. However, that enables a much higher sensitivity. Just imagine that each karyotyping band now has thousand distinct labels that would boost the sensitivity greatly and still would deliver all the advantages that karyotyping has. So how does this work? We usually start by isolating DNA from intact cell or nuclei, and we aim for ultra high molecular weight DNA. And as a result, we usually generate DNA molecules with a size up to two megabases and an average size between 250 and 300 kilobases in size. In the next step, we label the DNA with a green fluorescent label that is added to a six mer DNA motif which allows to label between 15 and 16 labels per 100 kilobases of human sequence. The labeled DNA molecules are then added to bi nano chips, but they are linearized in nano channels, so that each nano channel only contains a single long molecule. These labeled molecules are then flushed through these nano channels continuously and all the channels with all its molecules are imaged. The respective images are translated into digital molecules, which are then used, for example, to perform a de novo assembly of all these long molecules. This results in a map of our patient or sample, which can then be compared to the label pattern expected from the reference genome, and as such enable us to identify structural variants. And this is suited to identify all different kinds of structural variants. This can detect deletions and insertions down to 500 base pair in size, but it also can identify copy number changes, uh, including tandem duplications or even repeat array expansions, but interestingly also balanced events like translocation and inversions. The latest iteration of this technology offers two analysis modes for the goal of germline structure variant detection. It is recommended to perform a de novo genome assembly and usually an 80 to 100 X genome coverage is sufficient for that. Alternatively, one can cover a genome with up to 400 X, but then the analysis mode is more oriented towards somatic structure variants that are enabled by a rare variant pipeline. BioNano currently provides two algorithms for the analysis. The core of the technology is the SV calling tool. 
This indeed compares a map of a given sample to a reference, which really gives you highest resolution SV detection. But on top, basically for free, we get an SV calling tool that allows large CNV detection and aneuploidy detection by a coverage-based assay. After the analysis of a given sample, the first overview one could get is represented in a circus plot. So here you just see in the outer ring the ideogram of all human chromosomes. All the dots in the next ring represent all the called structural variants. The next ring shows a CNV profile genome white. In this example, I'd like to show you how a simple deletion can be identified by optical mapping. On the left hand side again, you see a genome wide circus plot. On the right hand side, you see a zoom in to just the circus plot of chromosome 4. Here, the same event is picked up by the CNV calling algorithm, highlighted by the blue arrow, as well as a yellowish dot by the SV calling algorithm. If I now click on the SV call and directly guide it to the event itself. Here we can see the blue map of the sample molecules compared to the reference, clearly showing a deletion encompassing the TET2 gene. The same event is also supported and called by the coverage-based CNV tool represented in the upper graph. After introducing these technical bases of optical mapping, I'd now like to highlight a few recent research studies. Here's just a brief selection of very interesting papers that made use of optical mapping, for example, to characterize extra, extra chromosomal DNA, understand low copy repeats and human subtelomeres, but also case reports of intriguing clinical findings as well as SVs in entire population. The most comprehensive comparison of structural variant calling technologies comes from the structural variant group of the Thousand Genomes Consortium. Mark Chasen and colleagues have recently demonstrated that certain types of structural variants, in particular those that are larger than one kilobase in size, are only picked up by optical mapping and not by sequencing approaches. This is demonstrated by all the black colored insertions and deletions in this diagram. In the last part of my presentation today, I'd like to highlight what we've recently done using BioNano's optical mapping. This encompasses two studies where we compared optical mapping compared to routine tools in leukemia and for constitutional cytogenetic aberrations. And I'll end with highlighting the research use of BioNano. In the first study, we were interested whether optical mapping can identify all the previously analyzed somatic events that have been identified in 48 leukemia samples. Classical detection was done by karyotyping fish and or CNV microarrays. And the great news is that we identified 100% concordance for all the variants that were present in more than 10% variant allele fractions. Just to highlight some of the events that we identified, on the left-hand side, you see a genome-wide circus plot, and on the right-hand side, the zoom in to chromosomes 11 and 14, where the pink line illustrates a translocation that was previously known. By one simple click on the pink line, we're directly guided to the exact translocation breakpoint. Here you can see two reference maps for chromosome 11 and 14, and in the middle, again in blue, the assembled map of our sample, directly demonstrating that the breakpoint of this translocation is happening between the IGH and CCD, CCND1 locus. The breakpoint resolution that we usually achieve brings down the breakpoint to just a few kilobases. Just another click on the sample map allows us to inspect how many molecules support this event, giving us confidence in this event, but also informing us on the variant allele fraction for such a somatic event in the leukemia sample. Our leukemia study 
encompasses three CML cases, all carrying the hallmark aberration of a BCR able one fusion gene. Here you see summarized the three breakpoints detected in the able gene on the left hand side and the breakpoint for BCR on the right hand side. Overall, that directly gives us a better resolution than we would traditionally get from fish experiments. In this final example from our leukemia study, I'd like to illustrate how even very complex events can be detected. In this case, there was a monosomy 7 detected in the CNV profile, easily recognizable in the zoom in on the right hand side. But even more complex is a chromotriptic event that completely reshuffled chromosome 8 in this example. If we would zoom in to chromosome 8, we directly see the largely disturbed CNV profile. Underneath, we see all the blue fragments that are individual maps that show fused pieces of chromosome 8, which would enable us to completely reconstruct the completely reshuffled chromosome 8 in this chromotrypsis event. One additional tool that BioNano has launched recently is a genome-wide CNV visualization tool that is mimicking what we're used to from CNV microarrays. In this example, uh, we show a case with a trisomy 12 and a partial deletion on chromosome 13. And if you compare it in the zoom in for classical array profile versus the BioNano profile, these results look highly similar. The more details I'd like to point out are preprint of this study. In a separate study, we were curious to learn how good bionano optical mapping is able to identify constitutional chromosomal aberrations. If you're interested in great details of that study, please listen in to the presentation that my colleague Cornelia Nevening will give Tuesday at 12.15 at ESHG. Just to give you the high level summary of this study, we identify 100% concordance between bionano optical mapping and the previously retrieved data by karyotyping fish and CNV microarray. Finally, I've brought you two more very recent research findings that are yet unpublished. The first example is a collaboration with Roland Kuiper, a former colleague who now works in Utrecht. He has an interest in the study of atypical teratoid raptoid tumors, which can be caused by germline or somatic mutations of the smart b one gene. Roland's group was already studying one particular family for two years where they had the strong su suspicion for a SMARC-B1 germline mutation. However, so far they were unable to identify a mutation. Despite diagnostic Sanger sequencing, MLPA and even clinical exome sequencing. In their research group they even repeated whole genome sequencing by luminal short reads and still were unable to identify the potential cause of this disease. We shared an EBV cell line with us. We did careful DNA isolation and generated more than 300-fold genome coverage. By just very simple filters, we identified a total of 35 rare structure variants genome-wide. Strikingly, one of the 35 rare structure variants, namely an insertion, was detected in the smart b one gene, here visualized by the assembly of the patient material compared to the reference. If we zoom into the details of this bionano call, this is identified as a 2.8 kilobase pair insertion of unknown material, which is likely inserted between introns 1 and 3 of the smart b one gene. So very likely, this is the so far missing germline mutation that gives a strong predisposition to ATRT in this family. As it was impossible to PCR over this predicted insertion, we performed PEG bio high file genome sequencing and generated this high file genome with eightfold coverage with a mean read length of 20 kilobases. These data that we just generated last week supports the insertion, to make it even more precise, it's an insertion of 2,823 base pairs. Now we can also see the exact inserted sequence for this locus, and we can see 
that this is most likely an SVAE retro transposon insertion. This insertion occurs in an intron of SMARTP1. So our next steps in this study are to understand how an intronic SVAE insertion can lead to loss of function of that allele. And obviously an intriguing question would be whether there's many more unsolved cases with jumping retrotransposons that cause loss of function of disease allele. The final example I brought today is a case that we've been studying already for many years. We study a case of severe intellectual disability and the healthy parents. This case was already previously studied by CMV microarrays, exome sequencing, genome sequencing, and even long read PEG bio sequencing. None of the technologies identify the disease cause, nor any de novo structural variant. We have now studied fresh EDTA blood by bio-nano optical mapping, and genome-wide identify more than 6,000 structural variants. Of those, 51 are rare events, and never identified in 200 control genomes. We now use the parental genomes to subtract all the inherited variants. We are left with a single candidate de novo structural variant, which is called as a deletion. Here we see a zoom into the region where this deletion was called. This is just downstream of the colon de Vries syndrome that is located in 17Q21.31 and overlaps with the large segmental duplication cluster as shown on the bottom. What we identified in this patient is that next to a paternally inherited duplication depicted in green affecting the NSF pseudogene 1, we identify a de novo deletion that affects the NSF gene just downstream, still overlapping with a segmental duplication. By having breakpoint accuracy of just a few kb, we managed to PCR over the breakpoint by a breakpoint spanning PCR, which resulted only in a successful PCR product in the deletion allele of the patient, but not in the father nor mother, which confirms this event to be de novo. We've also just sequenced this PCR product by PEG bioamplicon sequencing, and that gave us based per resolution of the event and confirmed that we identified a 121 kilo base pair sized de novo deletion. This de novo deletion happened in one of the most complex regions of the human genome, which likely explains why this was never found by any of the previous sequencing assays. The gene that is disrupted in this case by the de novo deletion is NSF. NSF is expressed in brain and a potentially interesting candidate gene. It, however, it has been reported to be copy number variable. In the normal population, two to eight copies of this gene and pseudogene are reported. However, it still is intriguing to speculate whether the haploinsufficiency of this gene may be involved in disease. It is therefore highly intriguing that in a very recent study, a Japanese group published several cases of de novo NSF point mutations that cause infantile epileptic encephalopathy. The authors of that study speculate that the identified point mutations exert a dominant negative effect. This already brings me to my summary slide. Today I try to show you that I see potential in using bio-nano optical mapping to replace classical cytogenetic methods. Uh, encouragement for that we get from our leukemia study where we identified all previously known clinically relevant structural variants with an allele, uh, allelic fraction of 10% or higher. We also saw full concordance for all our constitutional samples. At the end of today's talk, I've shown you two intriguing examples where we identified hidden structural variants that remained refractory to all previous sequencing approaches. I personally believe that optical mapping with its great read length and its ease of analysis may truly allow a cytogenetics revolution. There is additional innovations coming that make this even more exciting. For example, there is a second label that can be used and a second color that can be detected with the current instruments that, for example, enables methylation detection. 
the rope med life scene should also allow for much lower per sample price in the near future. And we already have preliminary data that show us higher coverage that enables somatic mutation detection of SVs better present than less than 1% of all the cells of a given sample. This concludes my talk. I'd like to acknowledge all my co-workers in Nijmegen as well as other collaborators. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. Very sorry about the sound quality. We're working with the technical people uh, on this. We are very much over time, but we have time for one question. Alex, can you please answer the somatic mutation detection rate? People ask that. I, I posted your details uh, in the uh, chat, so people might contact you with more questions. But could you contact, uh, yeah, answer the somatic mutation uh, question? So you mean the, the sensitivity for how low yes. you can go? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so so far, all the SVs we've detected down to 10% vary in the yield fraction, we all find all of them back. And we have several that are lower than 10% that we also identify. Uh, and with identify, I mean automatically called. We now have very recent data that was just generated in the last month, uh, where we can get, generate up to 1500x coverage, still basically for the same price, but simply running the instrument longer. And now we can see a lot of events that are just in the 1% range of uh, variant allele fraction. So that is actually very promising. Great. I think it would be super interesting now to get also Dr. Lose into the loop and talk. Uh, I would be really interested to compare this technology with uh, the long read sequencing technologies, but unfortunately we don't have time for this. I want to thank uh, the speakers um, for giving excellent talks, uh, great science. I, this is always my favorite session. And I would like to thank all the 3,500 uh, 3, people out there listening in their living rooms. This is just the start. And the next biggest highlight, I would say, is going to be the What's New session. But there's so many sessions. Go online, check them out. And some of them will be available throughout the conference. Thank you for joining and uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. See you at the conference.